Namibia is a place of great inspiration, where dedicated people make a difference. At Ongaba, our inspiration comes from the land and the life it supports. Our conservation efforts are bold, land reclamation, reintroduction of wildlife, and the creation of a partnership for the future that is vital for the health of the planet and our souls. At home in this eco-region, nestled in the mountains and plains surrounding Itasha, Ongaba protects this land while providing visitors with wonderful hospitality, offering comfort, luxury, and a connection to the earth. This is why Ongaba exists, ecotourism for the next generation. Central to the design of the new Andersons at Ongaba is the connection to the wild, and it is most keenly felt at the waterhole and nearby underground viewing hide, level view of the prolific wild and bird life on Ongaba Game Reserve, in a setting that inspires intimacy without intrusion. Ensuring a light footprint and an exceptional experience, Andersons has seven guest suites and a family unit, maximum of 18 guests. Each suite is designed as a direct extension of the landscape with a natural stone buttress that draws guests in and engenders a deep sense of place. Using natural elements and luxurious touches, the spacious suites reflect the environment, offering guests a climate-controlled sanctuary in the bush. The ambition of Andersons at Ongava is to integrate science and research with the luxury African safari experience. Ongava was founded on bold ideas. Taking a lesson from the wild and the power of symbiotic relationships, Andersons provides an interactive hub where cutting edge technology meets hands-on field-based research. As a guest at Andersons, you can absorb the fascinating discoveries of creative science produced by resident scientists, visiting researchers and conservationists. You know, one of the things that Ongava has become pretty well known for is its preoccupation with camera traps. <laughs> so we've been using camera traps here for the last 10 and more years. We have a database of something like 9 million photographs uh, taken over many years, over many days, at many waterholes. Uh, and these provide all sorts of really interesting and valuable information we can or number of species, we can identify individuals by their spot patterns or their coat patterns, things like giraffe, things like uh, leopards, cheetahs, uh, and others, so we can uh, count the number, we can work out how many individuals there are in the reserve. Uh, we can look at age ratios, sex ratios, we can uh, discover when these animals come to drink, how often they come to drink, uh, their relative abundance in different parts of the reserve, so a whole lot of really interesting information. What also turns out to be interesting is that they're probably using these, rain, the, these rubbing stumps as some sort of marking uh, post, uh, where by uh, rubbing off pheromones or uh, secretions from their body, they probably leave information for other rhinos about who's, who's who. I mean, each, each individual probably having a distinct smell, uh, each individual having a smell that would, deter, you know, would uh, indicate whether it's a male or female. Uh, what sort of age, what sort of reproductive condition, if it's a female coming into heat, that would be of interest to the bulls in the area. Uh, so these uh, rubbing posts at least seem to uh, serve some sort of communication post. And then what was interesting over and above that is how many other animals come along and sniff, uh, and you might see uh, an elephant walking past uh, one of these, uh, this post here, and as it walks past, it just puts it trunk, its trunk over the post, has a quick smell, and then walks on. So you can't help feeling and, uh, that you know, a lot of other animals are picking up information from uh, this rubbing post, and some of the animals, in fact, uh, rub, rub themselves uh, on that post. So that was uh, you know, just a lot of fun to watch these videos as they came in when we uh, took them off the camera trap and to see what was going on there, seeing animals that we had no, never expected to pay any attention to a, a rubbing post.
so we've been setting up that um, visitor center, setting up all the, um, the displays and what to say, what could be interesting for other people. And mostly it was a great experience in learning how to explain the science, like what we found, what we talk about, the tracking, the statistical analysis and all that trying to translate that into something that people who are not familiar with the concept can actually understand. I think that we uh, managed to have kind of that in between stating the fact and really saying what we know right now in a way that every people can understand. And in a level that if you just want to look at the images or at the pictures, then you get what we're trying to say. But if you want to go deeper, there is a lot of text to read and there is us just next door. So you can basically come and talk to us and ask us more specific questions and how it relates to Ongava itself, but also of what is done basically all across Africa and all across the world, because a lot of themes are actually um, really the same at this stage. It's just trying to understand how ecosystem works and how we can protect them the best we can, allowing for human activities. So getting to that, uh, there's different, um, I guess, different topics that we can uh, touch on. Um, the first one is obviously um, the, the tracking uh, of, of animals. It's been a revolution since uh, now we can actually stick collars or other tracking devices on animals. Not only large carnivores, there's a lot of tracking on large carnivores, but we can now also track birds all across the world. We can also track butterfly, believe it or not, um, and other, all other type of animals. And this tracking, you hear a lot about tracking, GPS, satellite, VHF. So basically the purpose of tracking is allowing us to know where an animal is, not yet what it's doing exactly, where an animal is without us being in the field. So a few years ago, um, we decided to look at leopard movements on Ongava and the habitat that they um, were using. Um, the reason for this, this study was we were perplexed by the fact that we were seeing leopard at waterholes on occasion and through camera trap data where we've got a, a remote sensing camera based at a, at a particular point on the property at a waterhole. We were seeing these cats but we weren't seeing them regularly um, on game drive um, with guests and um, uh, through management observation around the property. So we really didn't know what areas they were using on Ongava, how many there were um, and we, we wanted to answer this question. So we set about um, uh, a small project which involved the immobilization of two leopards, one male and one female. Um, and we were going to put GPS collars on these leopards and track their movements around the property um, so we could get a better understanding of the spatial utilization uh, on Ongava and what they were doing. Okay, so we successfully collared a, a male and a female um, and uh, we started to get some quite interesting information about their movements around the property. Um, if you look at this, this 3D model below us, um, it's a 3D model of Ongava. There's um, a black line around it which shows the property. Um, on that end, on the northern side, is Etosha National Park, and then all around the southern and eastern and western sides is commercial cattle farms. There's two different colors that are visible on the map. One is blue and one is, is red-orange. The blue is the male um, and his movements. Every dot and line is an is a GPS coordinate of that animal moving around the property, and the same for the red, that's the female. Interestingly, there seems to be quite a lot of difference in the habitat that these two animals um, were using. The female stuck to the sort of hilly, rocky spine range that we have that runs east-west um, through Ongava, and she stayed pretty much for the whole study period in that um, quite exclusive um, geographical uh, uh, environment. The male, on the other hand, moved right across the property and we had him on the plains, in the hills. He really utilized probably two thirds of Ongava, about 200 to 250 square kilometers. The other interesting thing that we noticed was that, that the female um, seemed, to, seemed to move outside the property a little bit, whereas the male did not. We have electrification on our southeast and western borders to stop animals moving, large carnivores moving out of Ongava into, um, into farmland where they are they come into conflict, conflict with people. Now that, that electrification is quite um, impermeable for large carnivores such as um, spotted ahina and, um, and lion, but she seemed, the female seemed to be able to, at, at not regular intervals, but every now and again seemed to be able to get over the fence into the neighboring farm and come back to Ongava. So it's, it's an interesting um, observation that we, we noticed about the, 
permeability of electric fences to smaller predators, climbing predators such as, such as leopard. Um, given our, um, the goals of our study, which was to try and understand habitat use on, on Gava by leopard and, um, and why we weren't seeing these cats regularly, the, the study was a success. Um, it became pretty clear that leopard are here and in numbers. But because of the type of habitat we have, the thick Mopani, mixed Mopani felt we have, and the rocky Dolomite hills, they are often in areas which are inaccessible to vehicles. It was, it was fantastic that this, the study that we did on a local area on our game reserve has had further application in the scientific, uh, the greater scientific world. So the importance that it has for, for sharing the information is whether by diversity and having all of this genetic diversity, we would like to identify the unique aspects um, and the, what we call in a biodiversity context is these hotspots. So these are areas that are very much um, extremely variant, so diverse in um, species numbers and within the diversity of, of the species for the survival. And we really think these will be unique areas that are you know, going to be very important for the preservation of it. Um, so hopefully, it will, at the end of the day, with any researchers, if we're able to identify these areas with these unique individuals, it's what a lot of people would like to see um, because tourism will come for animals, um, some will come for landscape. Obviously, I'm not quite sure which one's the most, but um, they will come and see, they want to come and see Africa in, a, in specific in a state of being natural, uh, coming from overseas specifically, I would imagine. Um, you know, coming here trying to see everything as natural as possible. And with the information we could provide is, yeah, to ensure it stays as natural as possible and that there's as minimal influence as can be. Everybody. Welcome to the Ongava Game Reserve. We'll be joining Stewart with his routine gyro flight over the Ongava Game Reserve and see what it's from above. Hey! We have just returned from an early morning gyroplane patrol. Um, around the Ongava Game Reserve. We carry out this patrol a few times a week and the purpose of this patrol is to monitor animals and the game reserve from the air. Generally there's two of us in the aeroplane so we have maximum number of people um, observing. So I have an APU member, he travels with me and he's always armed with a 300 millimeter DSLR camera and anything of interest we can then photograph um, and GPS the coordinates of, of what, whatever we're finding. Some of the stuff we looked at this morning, we were in both the western end of the game reserve and the, the southeastern corner and we were looking for specific animals, specifically rhino. This ties into our monitoring program and so those coordinates and those photographs, because we're able to identify the individual animals from the photographs we take, those photographs and GPS coordinates get um, entered into our sighting information and database. We can obviously add that into the monitoring that we do on the ground um, with the ground patrols. The gyroplane has been on Ongava for a couple of years. It was initially bought as a monitoring platform, which is what we're using it for, what we used it for this morning. But it has a whole bunch of other functions as well, which has been um, quite successful at. One of the other areas that we've used it in is firefighting. So during the dry season, if we've had a good rainy season, you get quite a lot of grass around the property. and. Um, Late August, September, you often get lightning that can ignite the dry bush at the end of the end of the dry season, causing bushfires. Now, having a, an air wing that is above the firefighting effort to coordinate firefighting efforts on the ground is critical and very successful, containing fires to small areas on the property and thus reducing the risk of damage to property and um, and lodges and fences. We also use the, the aircraft for monitoring of our boundary fences. We have a common boundary with Etosha National Park and we have a fair amount of movement between Etosha and us, especially by elephant. Um, elephant uh, don't respect boundaries or fences and even if they are electrified like parts of our northern boundary, they tend to find ways of breaking that fence. So, you know, a couple of patrols a week, looking at that boundary along with all of our foot patrols on the boundaries as well. It helps us maintain that fence for Itosha and for us and make sure that it is maintained to a good condition. Another area that we've used the gyroplane for is assisting in our neighbours. So I have assisted uh, with patrols and flights 
on other custodianship farms in our area. So custodian, the custodianship farms I'm referring to are rhino custodians. As mentioned in a couple of the other chats I've had with Franco, Ongava is a member of the Black Rhino Custodianship Program, which means that we are looking after black rhino on behalf of the state. There are other farms or game reserves like us around our region. And in the event that those farms have had issues and they've required air support, we have assisted in that process. We've also assisted in a whole range of social events, I wouldn't call it events, but problems. So we had some farmers to the south who had some horses stolen. We assisted with that process as well. So it's proved not only to be a valuable tool for Ongava, but also to the local uh, the community around us, Etosha and our southern neighbors. The reason why gyroplanes are used and why we prefer this particular aircraft is it has, it has some characteristics which make it feel like you're operating in a helicopter more than in an aeroplane. As we experienced this morning in our flight, you are able to slow down to quite low ground speeds, which makes it an ideal stable platform for um, photography and observation of wildlife in this environment. If you're in a fixed wing aircraft, you tend to be flying quite a bit faster and it's quite difficult to slow down, especially mid-air. Because this is a rotorcraft, you have that ability. The main rotor, which is above me, is, uh, is not engine driven. It's uh, in permanent auto rotation. So if in the event that you do have an engine failure or you do have to land in the bush, which I've had to do in the past, the speeds at which you are coming in and the rolling distance or the land roll when you hit the ground is quite short, which obviously makes it much better aircraft, safer aircraft to operate in this environment. An additional major benefit for gyroplanes over things like helicopters and fixed wings is the is the hourly cost. They are significantly cheaper to operate than say a, a helicopter or a fixed wing aircraft and thus the platform that you're getting in terms of slow flying aircraft, rotor aircraft at a, at a reasonable price, operating price is a significant benefit to why gyros are being operated on game reserves like Ongava. And that is uh, in a nutshell why Ongava has invested in a gyroplane and why it is proving a very good tool for monitoring security, anti-poaching um, and uh, operations on Ongava Game Reserve. So this morning's patrol um, started off just at sunrise. So we got up nice and early. There's sort of a period in the day where light is better for looking at animals on the ground. And if the light is coming from an angle, so the sun's just over the horizon, it is easier to observe animals and the bush felt. So we got airborne at about 7, 7.15 and we went on a patrol out to the west initially. We were specifically looking for white and black rhino in that area. We located a fair number of white rhino. These animals were circled, GPSed and photographed. After that, uh, we headed back towards the eastern part of the game reserve. We did do a few fly, uh, flyovers of some of the other water holes looking for lion. We didn't locate any this morning, but as we moved east, uh, we found some more black rhino, some elephant and some white rhino. Again, these animals were looked at, circled, photographed, GPS. So those coordinates can be used as part of our monitoring database. So that all gets entered into a main database, which records all the information about protected and endemic and uh, especially protected animals on Angaba. We did make a turn on the northern boundary just to have a look at the state of the fence and the fire break. We've started cleaning fire breaks along our northern and eastern boundary initially, which was the first part of the fence that we clear. And the reason for that is at this time of, of year, the, most of the winds are from the uh, northeast and the east. So in the event that there is a fire, the real threat is from that direction. So our ranch staff have been out making sure that those boundaries are clear. The other thing we were looking at was uh, we had an adult male lion, which looked like it had been chased out of Ongava by resident males on the property and it had got stuck between the, the two fences. We're double fenced on all sides and Itosha has a small cattle fence which is electrified and a big game proof fence and this line, male lion had stayed between those fences for about a week. We had made sure it had um, water and it was in good condition but a decision was taken over the weekend with uh, the Ministry of Environment and Tourism to try and attract it back into Etosha National Park. So we flew down that boundary and in inspected uh, that area to see if the lion was still there. It does seem to have moved back into the park. There was no obvious sign of it. So that was a su success. <laughs>also happened to pick up one of our boundary patrols, anti-poaching unit patrols who are monitoring and protecting our, 
our fence lines. So their roles are to maintain the fence, check for holes, make sure that nobody is coming over the boundary into Nongava that could potentially threaten our wildlife here. And we happened to come across one of those patrols this morning as well. After that part of the flight, we started to head back towards the operations base and our runway. We landed after an hour and a half of flying time and it was a success, the flight, I think, uh, from a monitoring perspective and what we saw and what we were able to, um, to ascertain from the air this morning, it was a, um, a job well done. We've spoken about monitoring and animals and observation of animals, but it's also very good from a geological perspective and a vegetation survey perspective. So once you're up in the air, you can get a very good idea of what the geology is on the, sort of around the property and how the vegetation ties into that. So while we were up today, we were flying over both hilly areas and flat areas, and it was quite clear, and I pointed this out during the flight, that the effects of overgrazing in the past when Ongava was still a cattle farm in the in the 1970s and 80s. It's still evident in that you've seen these monocultures of Mopani felt or cataphractus, which are out-competing grass. So I also pointed out this morning on the flight where we have cleared bush to try and reverse those overgrazing impacts, you can clearly see the, the distinction between grassed areas and, well, heavily grassed areas and areas which are, are depleted of grass. And normally the areas without grass are those areas that are still showing those um, signs of of historical overgrazing with bush encroachment. You're not seeing a lot of grass in those areas after the wet season, but you are seeing that in areas we are clearing. So by getting that oversight from the gyro, it helps us um, develop future planning for um, further areas that need to be cleared for bush clearing on Angava. And the reason we do things like bush clearing is to improve habitat, help with fire management, and improve or increase the grazer capacity on Ongava Game Reserve. Uh, we would have noticed this morning while we're flying that Ongava is quite a bushy area. It's sort of what we call mixed mapani felt, so there's large stands of Cumifera, Acacia, uh, Mopani felt, Cataphractus, uh, Combritums, and it's, it's fairly dense. So there's a lot of good browse in there, but there are areas that um, can be targeted for bush clearing and improving grazing. We also pointed out on the, on the flight this morning that we have started a new fire management plan, which is clear from the air. Um, we are cutting the, the game reserve into six large blocks. These blocks are defined by large cleared areas along a road. These areas, they fulfill a number of different functions. One, they open up the bush next to the side of the road, so it improves game viewing for our hospitality operations because animals generally come down into those open areas. It improves grazing, so there's more grazing for, for animals like white rhino and zebra species and springbok. And then um, it's acting as a natural fire break as well. So historically, <clears throat> when we fight fire and we use the gyro to manage that process, it's quite a reactive process. So you are reacting to a fire that started due to lightning or some other reason, humans playing with matches or whatever the reason is. But you're always reactive and you generally have to fight fire with fire in this environment. So you put in backburns, which can actually be more destructive than the original bushfire. By cutting the game reserve up into these big blocks and making them robust in terms of having these grass boundaries on the edges of these blocks. If you are to get a lightning strike in those blocks, then you can um, let that fire burn naturally because in most cases, fires that start naturally, they burn out by themselves. They don't actually require human intervention, but we tend to intervene because we're worried about the consequences of if it burns the whole game reserve down. So we were able to view that from the gyro this morning. We could clearly see those uh, demarcated areas that we're working on in terms of opening up those big fire breaks to allow natural burns on Angava in the future. The other thing we use the gyro for, which I've pinpointed two areas uh, for future dam development. So I wouldn't say easy, but it's, it's much easier to see from the air the runoff roots of water um, in the rivers on Ongava. So it may sound like a simple thing, but dependent on the season and how much rain we get, there are areas that get better runoff than others. So where we saw the lions on the, on the second day, that was a rain collection point. And we like to develop those rain collection points, those dams, and we have a, have a few more points that are set out on Ongava. And the gyro has been able to help us with that process because we can look at the, um, the runoff into those particular points and where we're going to build those dams. So it's, it's quite helpful in the placement of future dams on the property. You've met John Mendelssohn, who's the director of the research center. John is very interested in the geology of Ongava, and especially sinkholes in the Dolomites, so small caves that occur throughout the Dolomite ranges that occupy about 70% of the southern areas of Ongava. So John and I have done some surveys in the gyro where we, we literally were flying around, and because you can fly so slowly with a gyro plane, you can actually sort of weave in and out of these Dolomite ridges and Dolomite ranges and GPS pinpoint potential cave sites, which we can then go and have a look at on foot. So there is quite a bit of engagement with the research center. And um, the hope is that, you know, John can then uh, can go to those sites on foot and, in, and investigate them with either a um, with camera 
or other forms of technology to have a look at how deep they are and what's, what's actually in the caves and what's formed the caves. There are other platforms you can use to look at things from the air like drones, but when you're actually in an aircraft, you can cover quite big distances. The gyroplane forms a, an important part of our security efforts on, on, on Ungava. And I think it's important to understand that, you know, anti-poaching or poaching prevention, as we like to call it here, because we're trying to prevent poaching, as opposed to being reactive after a poaching incident has happened, is all about boots on the ground. So people who are out patrolling, monitoring, making sure that this environment is safe. But you need to add or bolt on technology to that in order to assist it. So the gyroplane is one of those technologies we built. It's only a piece of the puzzle, but it's an important piece of the puzzle because it allows us to get up and above and to potentially look for poachers, potentially look for animals that we're missing. We know may be ill or, or injured. It's been very successful in that role and in supporting that anti-poaching and prevention effort that we are engaged with on Ungava. You know, the conservation environment in Namibia has changed dramatically over the last 10 to 12 years, especially in, in rhino conservation, in that we are faced with ever-increasing poaching threats from organized crime syndicates who are trying to equip and instigate incursions into our property to kill rhino, to chop their horns off and take those out and sell them onto the black market. So the boots on the ground are the most important part of that program, but the gyroplane and other forms of technology are critical in the support of that role. And the combination of using layers of technology and people um, as a deterrent to would-be poachers coming onto Ungava is, is really what we're about. Thank you.